I mean, these people have no clue as what the biology of this cancer is. So you have all these people out there treating people with toxic drugs, radiation, immunotherapies. And most of these folks, I hate to say it, are, are, are pretty naive with respect to understanding the biology of cancer. And once you understand the biology of cancer, um, a lot of this stuff can be explained and you can achieve the same end, end goal of killing tumor cells uh, relatively easily, easily, easily. How should a normal cell respire, create energy, use energy? Oh, I mean, I mean, look at every one of our organs, um, the majority of our organs, that is. They, they're consisted of cells. We have liver cells. We have colon cells. We have breast cells. We have bladder cells, brain cells. You know, they, they all perform a specific function uh, in our body. And um, they get nutrients from the bloodstream and oxygen from the bloodstream. It's all energy. Everything is energy, right? ATP, adenosine triphosphate, is the molecule that allows all of these proteins and lipids to do their job, right? And being synthesized and broken down. You want to know how powerful energy? Take cyanide. You're dead in seconds, right? You stop your energy instantly, you're dead, right? Case closed. Everything is, is finished, right? That's how powerful energy is. So you take away energy, things die. So you take away energy, things die. So in order to remain alive, you have to make energy. So the way you make energy is, you, is we use oxidative phosphorylation. So we breathe in oxygen, and uh, oxygen serves as, a, as an acceptor of electrons to drive a gradient to make ATP. But the fuel, the carbons that make the ATP uh, um, that, we, that we generate is um, from the food we eat. So the foods are all broken down and eventually enter into the mitochondria uh, where they're fully oxidized. It's a burning, it's like a combustion engine. It's like a, a gas combustion engine, except the fuel is the carbon food that we eat rather than gasoline. All of the cells in our body, for the most part, uh, are all respiring. Uh, we use oxygen, we breathe, because if we stop breathing, um, we die, right? I mean, it's just that simple. So then in, in cancer now, in an unhealthy cell, how does it change? What's, hap what's changing? I know you, you have some things here like a, re a retrograde response, mitochondrial breakdown, all these things. I guess explain that process. The difference between a cancer cell and a normal cell is the tumors lose their capacity to respire. Um, so uh, they, they, they ferment. What causes cancer, and as I've shown you, uh, almost anything from the environment um, uh, can it, pr produce uh, inflammation or damage. Like, for example, you take a carcinogen. These, you hear about these carcinogens. That uh, is a chemical or something that causes cancer. It doesn't only have to be a chemical, but it's, it, it, whatever it is, it causes cancer, carcinogen. Now, what the carcinogen does is in some group of cells, in some tissue, you can get uh, in, inhibition of oxidative phosphorylation. And if that's not, if, if that happens in a, in a very chronic or gradual way, the cell gradually adapts to, to a fermentation metabolism, which is an ancient form of energy that existed for all organisms on the planet before oxygen came into the atmosphere. So uh, there was a time in our Earth's history where there was no oxygen in the atmosphere. This came as the result of certain microbial organisms producing oxygen, um, which then saturated the environment, or to say saturated, it, the, at, the atmosphere began to take on oxygen. Before that, everything was fermenting. There were living organisms on our planet before oxygen came into the atmosphere. And these guys were all fermenters. They, were, they would get energy from non-oxygen uh, non mechanisms. And that's a primitive ancient pathway. That is and both are built into us as yes, humans. Yes, we, we have this heirloom in our body. 
Um, and some cells like erythrocytes have it completely because they lose their, their nucleus and they lose their mitochondria. So they're primarily fermenters. The situation in the cancer cell is it becomes locked into lactic acid production because the very structure, the organelle that's responsible for oxfos is damaged. Now that can be damaged by a number of different things, carcinogens, like certain chemicals get into our cells and they, they take up residence. They actually into, they go into the mitochondria and you can see fluorescent carcinogens in the mitochondria. Well, that's, that's knocking out the function of that organelle, forcing that cell to now engage in the ancient fermentation pathway in order to stay alive. Because if it doesn't, it's going to die. So, but cancer cells don't form overnight. That damage requires uh, a long process. As Warburg said, it's a gradual replacement of oxidative phosphorylation by fermentation. And uh, it's a gradual process because if it happens too quickly, the cell dies and you'll never get a cancer cell. But on a chronic basis, uh, a chronically disturbed uh, cell uh, will have the capacity, depending on the cell, to transition and eventually become more and more fermentative. And, um, and you're right, the signaling. So when the cell has damage to its respiration, it signals to the nucleus to increase pathways and sustain energy through glycolysis. And also another pathway called glutaminolysis, which is the utilization of glutamine in a fermentation mechanism. So these, these cells then are transitioning away from oxidative phosphorylation and becoming more and more dependent on substrate level phosphorylation, which is a fermentation me mechanism. The origin of the disease is damage to the mitochondria. If your mitochondria become damaged, you know, they, um, they form reactive oxygen species. And they, they can damage the DNA, the proteins. That leads to gene mutations in the nucleus as well. So, so when you damage the respiration, you damage proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids, which then accumulate somatic mutations in the, in the cell. At the same time, the cell is fermenting. And um, uh, colleagues of ours down here at Tufts University School of Medicine, Carlos Sonenshin and Ana Soto, uh, clearly showed that we have two conditions in our states, you know, the quiescent and the default state. And what happens is uh, cancer cells enter into their default state, which is proliferation. And why the cells in our body don't proliferate all the time is because they're regulated by the mitochondria in a very orchestrated energy efficient system. But when the mitochondria become, uh, become damaged, um, uh, the cells enter a default state, which is unbridled proliferation. And before oxygen came into the environment on the planet a um, billion years ago, a couple of billion years ago, uh, all of the cells were in a high, a high state of proliferation. We called it the stage of unbridled proliferation. So they were fermenting like crazy and they were proliferating like crazy. So what's happening as the cancer cell, as the normal cell gradually descends into this uh, dysregulated energetic state, it falls back on the way it was before oxygen came into the planet, which was unbridled proliferation. And they use fermentation metabolism to drive this process. So all cancer cells suffer the same problem. If you look at them, they're all ferment, they're all proliferating, and they use a fermentation metabolism because their respiration is defective. Everything starts with the mitochondria damage. Now, and people say, well, what about the genetic cancers, like uh, leaf many and BRCA1 and these kinds of genes? They, they damage mitochondria. So mitochondria is the prime cause. All the other things are secondary causes. Carcinogen is a secondary cause. Uh, X-ray is a secondary cause. Inflammation is a secondary cause. Uh, aging is a secondary cause. Uh, rare inherited mutations are secondary causes because no cancer is known that has normal mitochondrial respiration. So everything goes through the mitochondria first. So this is what we call the oncogenic paradox. In other words, how is it possible that we can all get cancer? Like say, uh, we have a lot of breast, women have a lot of breast cancer, but every woman doesn't get breast cancer from the exact same initiating problem. The problem is that that breast cancer could have come from an inherited mutation that damage re damages respiration. It could have come from an occluded milk duct that causes inflammation, damages respiration. So you have two different, you have breast cancer from two, two different causes, but they both have the same common problem. They are fermenting.
So you take away energy, things die. So you take away energy, things die. So you take away energy, things die. So what we what we did was we just went back to the very origins and found and found out very clearly that this is a disease of energy metabolism. And in order for those cells to proliferate, they have to ferment. So what do they ferment? They ferment glucose and glutamine. So if you take glucose and glutamine away, you achieve the same goal as chemo and radiation. You kill the tumor, but it's so precise. It only kills the tumor cell and doesn't harm the rest. And if you bring the whole body into ketosis while you target glucose and glutamine, your, your, the rest of your body gets super healthy and only kills the tumor cells. Now, what's wrong with that? Well, let's go through exactly what your press pulse approach is. The metabolic therapy, press pulse metabolic therapy, can manage the disease uh, with minimal toxicity. It's based on the, on the underlying biology of the problem. So we know the tumor cells are fermenters, and, and they ferment glucose and glutamine. And if we take glucose and glutamine away, uh, we should be able to theoretically kill all the tumor cells because they can't rely on anything else. As I said, energy is energy. And the tumor cell needs a fermentation energy, but they're very restrictive in the kind of energy they can get because you got to have a fuel that's abundant in the, in the microenvironment and can generate and replace uh, oxidative phosphorylation. So the two most abundant fuels that can do this are glucose and glutamine, an amino acid called glutamine, which is the most abundant amino acid in our body. It's very easy to target glucose, okay? We just stop eating, go on ketogenic diets. And once you're in therapeutic ketosis, you can even take insulin to blow your blood sugars down to almost the lowest levels, you know, barely detectable. What are these tumor cells going to do when one of their prime fuels is just reduced out of, out of existence? They're going to they're gonna die. So unless they can use glutamine, they're going to die. So we're going to kill a whole slug of tumor cells just by depriving them of their glucose. Now, that leaves the tumor cells that need the glutamine. Now, there's another group of tumor cells that use glucose and glutamine. Most cancers consist of a bunch of different kinds of cancer cells. They're not all one kind of cell. Some, some of them are heavily glucose dependent. Some of them are heavily glutamine dependent. It's based on the kind of cell that's in the tumor. So it, it's very interesting. We and others have shown that the cell that metastasizes, that's the cell that spreads through your body, that eventually is the most difficult to control. Is, is of the immune system. Our very immune system that's designed to protect us has now become corrupted. When you get corrupted ma macrophages, the macrophage is designed to, kill, to protect us from environmental toxins. It's designed to protect us from bacterial infections. It's a vicious kind of a cell. It lives in, it lives in, in hypo so if you get a big cut on your arm and you get bacterial infection, there's no, no oxygen. These macrophages come flying out of the bloodstream and they will kill the bacteria, and that's how you get pus and all this stuff. They're a very aggressive cell. That's the cell that, that becomes corrupted in our body when we have cancer, and that's the cell that metastasizes, which means it can spread through your whole body. It goes to your lungs, your brain, your colon. It spreads all over the body. So these are very aggressive cells. They go after bacteria in a very aggressive way. Now, they live in hypoxic environments, so this is a very important thing to know. They, they can live without oxygen because they've been genetically designed to do that. But when oxygen comes back into the environment, these cells can reconfigure into the lymph nodes and they go back into the circulation and they go around. But when they become corrupted, they start doing all this shit uh, un, uh, dysregulated. Now, and what are those cells eating to get their energy? They're eating glutamine like crazy. So, so uh, if you take away their glutamine, they croak. And, and uh, why are you using CAR T? Why are you using all this crazy stuff? When you just have to simply target the fuel. Now, I don't want to make it out like it's so simple because that same fuel also is needed by our normal immune system, our B cells, T cells, and normal max. So that's what we call the pulse. So we pulse and kill groups of tumor cells uh, as in a pulse, pull and then pull off, and then even feed them back the same fuel that we just targeted. But, but the dead cells aren't going to be able to use that fuel because they're already dead. So the few surviving cells will pick up the fuel 
uh, and then also all of our normal cells get healthy and a few of the tumor cells start getting healthy and then we hit them again, boom, killing only the tumor cells, not the normal cells, which are all transitioned over to ketones. So it's a gradual dec decimation of the tumor cells while enhancing the health and vitality of the rest of the body. And uh, so we close the front door on the glucose and we open and, open and shut and slam the back door on the glutamine and eventually the patient emerges from this without a tumor and, and, and very healthy. And we also know we've cleared up uh, vitamin deficiencies. We've cleared up inflammatory conditions. Well, that's and what's that's, interesting yeah. about it. I, I, you know, I read a quote from you. It says, uh, cancer treatment therapy should be restoration. Uh, can you imagine coming out of your treatment healthier than when you went in? Yes, exactly. And I feel like a lot of the things you're doing are just actually optimizing the body to perform better. The cancer cells are getting weakened, but your regular cells are becoming more resistant to disease. Yes. yes. Matter of fact, the patient that we just treated over there in Egypt uh, who had a glioblastoma, um, he was a metabolic mess when he came into the clinic. Okay, so he was overweight. He had high triglycerides. He was vitamin D deficient. He, he had all kinds of metabolic issues. He was a mess. And beside, he had a glioblastoma, the worst of the worst. So the first thing we did um, is we gave him a three-day water-only fast, um, which brought his body into a state where, and then we put him on a 900 kilocalorie a day ketogenic diet. And we did that for three weeks. And we, and we also treated him with certain drugs that work together, targeting glucose and glutamine. And then uh, we debulked after three weeks, we took out his tumor. Um, the guy was, had paralysis on his whole left side. He, he, his arm couldn't move. His leg was dragging. He had all these metabolic issues. And then he did an awake craniotomy where the guy was actually awake while the surgeon took out the tumor. And then as soon as the tumor was removed, we put him on a, um, a 1500, I think it was 1200 kilocalorie a day ketogenic diet with uh, certain drugs that target glucose and glutamine for three months. And then we did standard of care only because we had to. <laughs> the guys lose their license if they don't. And it was pushed off way to the end. And um, the guy's doing fine. It, you know, he was a corn farmer from Egypt. Uh, had glioblastoma like, like Senator John McCain does and many others, uh, Joe Biden's son and, and these poor folks. This guy's back working out in the fields now. He, he's, he's, he's much healthier. And he's, he's arm wrestling now with his left arm. And he's doing a dance. He can do a dance. I mean, the guy was paralyzed. He had all kinds of problems. And people say, oh, this is not, this is a fluke. This is a, the, this doesn't happen very, yeah, it doesn't happen because nobody does what we did. If you, if everybody did what we did, he'd get all these guys be like this. The, the press pulse therapy that we're using, you know, engages certain drugs that work to target uh, synergistically glutamine and, glut and glucose. So, um, so, so to some, to summarize this press pulse, you guys normally put them on a fast. Well, we then they're on keto. Yeah, we can actually do several. We can either put them on a restricted ketogenic diet first, and then go to the fast, the, which I'm a fan of. Yeah, yeah. I feel like it's a lot easier to go into a fast when you're already keto. Yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, and and uh, we 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 recognize this part. So so and then you know the the bottom line is get your glucose ketone index, which we published the GKI. Which, yep. which use the keto mojo or one of these precision extra things. Um, and then you just get your GKI uh, uh, at close to one as possible. Like you guys that are, don't have cancer, you guys can push your GKIs really low. You know, uh, Dominic got his GKI the lowest I've ever seen. I, I think it was down near 0.2 or 0.3 or something. It was really spectacular. But he went on. So, that ha so, that's a, so the GKI, for everyone who doesn't know, that it's uh, pretty much a, a measure, a formula. Um, that is your glucose to your ketone. ketone ratio. Yes. Essentially. Yes. So right now, yeah, most people on a Western diet would have a GKI of 40 to 50, you know, which right. we have very little ketones, a lot of glucose. But if you stop eating- Are ketones ever in the blood normally? Yeah. For someone who's eating a, a regular high carb diet? Yeah. I mean, they're very, very low. Um, okay. but they're there. They're measurable. Um, but they're very, very low. But if you stop eating for several days or a week or whatever on ketogenic diets, you know, your blood sugar goes down and your ketones go up. And, uh, you know, some people get blood sugars down in uh, if you do insulin like we do. I mean, we put we can put these mice in if they're in ketosis. Insulin doesn't have any effect on the brain. So um, if you're not in ketosis, insulin will kill you. So, again, right, because normally your blood sugar levels. Yeah. 
Well, if you're not on ketosis, if you drop them, you go and you drop on the ground. Right. But if you are in ketosis, your brain's getting a source of fuel, so they can go much lower, and yeah. you would feel totally normal. Really, and and it's called keto adaptation. So you get the patient into keto adaption, and uh, once they're in keto adaption, then you know your glucose. We can push those glucose levels down to very low levels, and that then is step one. Uh, keto adapted and also stress management because stress for a cancer patient increases glucocorticoids, which increase blood sugar. So we reduce stress by music therapy, yoga therapy, uh, exercise, uh, a variety of other things. Specifically exercise. Uh, what is the t intensity level you recommend we don't for know, someone on can uh, the, with cancer? I think this is why CrossFit is interested in knowing more about this because we'd like to be able to uh, determine uh, with preclinical systems you know, what re role of exercise is good? Is it intense? Is it periodic? Is it, you know, what, what level is it? Because if you do exercise too intensely, you can actually uh, cause inflammation in your body um, from the breakdown of, of tissues and things. And we, we want to make sure that, that we don't do anything that would exacerbate the problem. Because uh, like everything, it's a, it's a balance. You can't do too much. You can't do too little. It's that perfect balance of using exercise synergistically uh, with drugs and diets that um, that bring this body into a now new pristine state, which is putting maximal pressure on the tumor cells while enhancing, not harming any other part of your uh, of your body, and set not harming it, actually improving the efficiency. So then, once the patient's in this state of reduced stress and and reduced glucose. Then uh, we uh, add drugs that target glutamine, and then we go into hyperbaric oxygen. So we think hyperbaric oxygen therapy uh, will replace radiation therapy uh, as, as the way to kill tumor cells because glucose and glutamine are, uh, produce antioxidant activity in the tumor cell. So once it's like the tumor cell has a shield around it um, to prevent it from being against chemo and radiation. And that's based on, the, on their ability to ferment glucose and glutamine. So when you take glucose and glutamine away, these cells now become vulnerable to reactive oxygen species death. And hyperbaric oxygen or possibly ozone, we haven't tested that yet, but we plan to do that. And it costs money to do this, and it's very hard to get the money to put all these things together. So, so basically, we have a plan where we think we can absolutely kill all of the tumor cells without toxicity by exploiting their metabolic vulnerabilities and enhancing the health and vitality. But it's a staged system. So we have press therapy, which is a constant stress on the tumor cell while enhancing the body. And then we pulse with drugs, uh, hyperbaric oxygen, and various procedures to pop off these tumor cells, to kill them. And the drugs are normally what? Dropping glucose, uh, glutamine inhibitors, yeah, things like that? glutamine inhibitors. Right. So we can use like, uh, we use this drug called Don. You know, it's 6-diazonorleucine. Um, it was used years ago, um, and it's uh, it's a chemical that can be toxic if used in too high of a concentration. But we showed that when you use it with metabolic therapy at lower doses, it effectively kills tumor cells. So, and the, and now we have so many new drugs and procedures that can be brought into this into this uh, uh, approach that all can be used at much lower dosages with maximal maximal efficiency. So, um, so again, the whole strategic plan is gradually killing tumor cells without harming any part of the body. So you gradually get healthier and healthier as you decimate your tumor cells. <laughs> so, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, it's actually astonishes me sometimes when I see the patients that come out of this stuff. They, or they say, oh, you know, if we had a cure for cancer, people would know about it. Well, I'm telling you, we know about it.